Slice of Life, episode 14. That's Billy Horner. My name is Keith Rad. This is our evergreen show. If you missed one of these, you didn't miss anything. You can go back and watch them. We try to bring you as many good news stories that you can watch wherever, whenever. And today we bring you a couple more. This one, favorite social slice, will start with me. Uh, Billy, I need a minute. Uh, Mark Warner, senator from Virginia, gave the internet three minutes and 19 seconds of pure disgust. Now you're saying, well, this is a slice of life. It's supposed to be a nice show. Yeah, but we need to provide some kind of uh, levity in the situation. So just bear with me. Um, so Mark Warner, seemingly kind gentleman, looks like he's never been in a kitchen before, hasn't been in a kitchen in months, uh, decides that He's going to try to bring the internet something that he's good at or likes to do. He says, I have friends who sing songs, yada, yada, yada. What happens next is unbelievable. If there are children around, adults around, senior citizens around, infants around, pets, maybe you want to shield them. Brendan, roll the tape. So today we're going to create a tuna melt. What do we need? Well, we need some bread. We need mayonnaise. We need cheese. And we need good old-fashioned tuna. Let's get at it, all right? First of all, two pieces of bread. Put them out. I love mayo. I know my kids hate mayo, but make sure you get plenty on both sides. Comes the important part, the tuna. You gotta make sure you distribute this evenly across the bread in a way that's even and appropriate, again, if you're having trouble keeping up, you can pause because the placement of the tune is very important. I'm going with the MVP5, and my, one of my old favorites, usually about 30 seconds. See, you can whip up this favorite in virtually no time. My God, Billy, I wish I had a camera on me the first time I saw this video. My face reacts in 18 different ways. He grabs the bread, fine. Then he puts the mayo on the bread and a half gallon of mayo. Uh, and then as soon as that happened, I knew what the next step was. I didn't want to know what the next step was, but he grabs the tuna, opens it up, and like fishes it out while the water is dripping on the bread. What are you doing? My jaw drops. He gets the cheese on fine. It's like, okay, tuna melt. And then he puts it in the microwave for 30 seconds. This guy is lost. Absolutely lost. Lost. This is a diner classic, kitchen creation, and he's thrown in the microwave like it's a hot pocket you find at a ninety-nine cent store. This was ah, it's, uh, what planet are we on? <laughs> Help me! Yeah, it was um, it was not it was not good. <laughs> it was not good. The <laughs> amount of mayonnaise can only be dis dis described as offensive. Um, the ca the tuna right out of the can, not washing it, not mixing it together beforehand, lunacy. But I'm going to try to give him the benefit of the doubt here. Um, when he started off the whole thing by saying, this is pretty complicated. Um, if you're not a professional chef, have your finger on the pause button so you could follow along. Uh, that like drips in satire. So I'm going to hope that he was working on this as like a joke to try to become a little time of levity. Uh, during this time of need. Um, and I also think he's working on some legislation um, in uh, Congress for uh, some different subsidies for uh, restaurant workers. So maybe this was like a PSA for leave the cooking to the professionals or something. I don't know. Uh, but if, if it's not, if, that, if it's not that, and he was serious, this man should be locked up and put in prison because it was absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> Please, let's move on. I need some happiness, Billy. Please give me some happiness. All right, so for my social slice, uh, there ain't no party like a New Orleans party because the New Orleans party don't stop. Um, in true New Orleans style, in uh, Oshner Medical Center, they celebrated the release of their 1500th COVID patient, Kathleen Bennett, with a celebration that would be fit for Bourbon Street. As uh, Kathleen was wheeled out of the hospital, the staff uh, lined the halls and the uh, loudspeakers blasted while the saints go marching in and uh, played along the parade route. Uh, ben is a 57-year-old woman who had been hospitalized since March 27th and had been on a ventilator for 12 days uh, during her stay. So uh, she recovered, fully recovered, was able to, to get released and see her family. And uh, some good news. Uh, definitely better news than uh, a tuna melt for sure. 
Yeah, uh, the best part about that is 12 days on a ventilator. You hear Cuomo every day. I listen to the press conference as often as I can, and usually ventilator is equals no good. So 12 days on a ventilator, at least they you know, kept faith and fought through it. So props to that hospital for all that hard work, and props to you for turning around what was a bit of a, a sour start to this. Close, close to a finish that close second for my social slice. There was a video yesterday of Cuomo saying zero a million times and in different languages and all this thing. It's like a 90 second compilation. And somebody synced it up to how much run support does Jacob deGrom get? <laughs> and it was just, uh, it, it hit up good. It's so uh, that, that might make it next week or tomorrow. We'll see. But be on the lookout. It was great. <laughs> Time for some chicken parm heroes. Billy, I want to go right back to you. Something cool that you found going on around the country, something that maybe a lot of us won't think about, but enlighten us. Yeah, I mean, for, for us here in New York, the idea of living in a, in a world without internet is sort of outrageous, and uh, you can't really comprehend it, but there's a lot of parts of the country, rural areas, um, where it's not available, um, and there's just some people that just can't afford it, and they're, they're relying uh, strictly on their cell phones or things like that. So uh, today's hero isn't necessarily a person, it's more of uh, innovation. Um, so with schools closed across the country, is students forced to uh, adapt to a life of homeschooling and uh, parents forced to adapt to working from home while homeschooling. Um, internet is obviously a necessity, but uh, I looked up some stuff this morning. There's a, approximately 20 million people uh, across the country that don't have access to internet, which is a mind-blowing number. Um, so a large portion of this 20 million rely on the internet um, uh, local, to get internet from local libraries or uh, restaurants or in some cases shopping malls where they're gonna have uh, hotspots for them to, to use. So where everything's closed nowadays, none of that is available. So what a lot of school districts across the country have been able to do is sort of retrofit, I guess, the school buses that typically drive kids to and from the schools and making them mobile hotspots. So they've been driving them to the different areas that they serve and setting up internet and they just become a mobile hotspot. So in South Carolina, they've deployed 3000 school buses. Um, in South Bend, Indiana, there are 30 buses that are being deployed that have a wireless range of 300 feet in any direction. Um, so they set up from 8 a.m. in most places to 2 p.m. or 3 p.m., whatever the, the instance is with, with schools. In Austin, Texas, they received a $600,000 grant from Kajit, uh, a telecom company that has allowed the school district to equip 110 buses wow. that are sent out daily to provide wireless for students and their parents making uh, homeschooling possible. So uh, it's crazy to think, you know, that that's what life has become, I guess, and, and what, that, it's a ne uh, that it's so necessary to do things like this. But not everybody lives in a city. Not everybody has access to things. So it's a, a great way that schools are kind of adapting to the times and making sure that students are still able to get um, access to their educational materials. Yeah, things you really wouldn't think about. I mean, if, if you didn't have internet, you know, think you're a mom or dad or someone who's got a job, you have to work from home now. I mean, if you don't have internet, what are you going to do? And now right. kids that are learning at home that might not have internet, this is a terrific idea. Uh, yeah, internet's going to be like the next basic necessity in life that's coming down the pike because if you don't have it, literally off the grid it's not good <laughs> you can't participate in school now it really is i mean here, here in this in new york city and on long island um with homeschooling there's so many people and my wife works in a school there's so many students that didn't have computers or ipads or anything like that to even get access to the materials that were going to be needed for homeschooling so um schools came up with ways to adapt to that as well so it's it's you don't think about it i mean as a you know middle class person i don't necessarily have these issues but it's it's when you think about them it's it's obviously a necessity in having especially in this time of need where everybody's forced to stay home and learn and and work from home um you need whatever technology you can get yeah definitely my chicken farm hero today is in harlem where asap ferg harlem native donated 300 lunches from melba's on 114th street to healthcare staff at NYC Health and Hospitals in Harlem. The food looked amazing. Brendan, roll a little bit of that B-roll. Look at all the food. Uh, and Billy, you know that I'm a big foodie. Broadcast by shameless plug. I've got to get to Melba's one of these days because apparently, as I was doing a little research looking at the menu, 
They have an award-winning chicken and waffles. And I wish I had a picture. Oh, I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course. Uh, but apparently both ASAP Ferg and Melba were born in this hospital. So kind of cool to see people from the neighborhood giving back to their own neighborhood where they came from. I mean, it's that is a true American success story to grow up in that area, succeed, and then give back immediately when there's some some need that, that is uh, that is on the horizon. Yeah, it's it's great when you see people giving back to to the communities where they have gone on to success, and these people obviously look up to them as success stories coming from their their areas. So it's great to see when they give back to those those areas as well. I saw yesterday uh, Eminem in Detroit gave mom's spaghetti, which I was today years old when I found out that that was actually a thing. Uh, he's created po a pop-up shop and he's done things at Coachella and has pop-up shops in Detroit that serve mom's spaghetti. Um, so he had that yesterday where he delivered food to uh, Henry Ford Medical Center in Detroit too. So a good day for uh, some, some people in the hip hop community giving back to their communities. Time for sports. And even though they don't quite exist, somehow, some way they still do. Billy's wearing a jersey. We'll get to that in a moment. But I want to talk to you about the the hero that we didn't know we deserved and that we have now who's a New York Met and former Brooklyn Cyclone. Yeah, so obviously as a Mets fan and, and Cyclones employee, I'm a little biased when it comes to uh, our guys succeeding on the big league level and making it their, the, the climb to the big leagues. But Pete Alonso has sort of taken New York City by storm um, since he uh, became a Met last year uh, during his rookie season. Um, and yesterday, Pete and his fiance Haley formally announced the launch of Homers for Heroes. Um, so last year, Pete won the Home Run Derby and came with a nice $1 million prize for Major League Baseball. And he used um, a portion of the prize money he donated to the Tunnels for Towers Foundation here in New York, which does great things, and the Wounded Warrior Project. Um, and both Pete and Haley said that as part of you know, their charitable work with these organizations, they were introduced to the people who were directly impacted by their donation and saw what their money did for these people's lives and, and the impact that it could have. Um, and they saw that this is something that they wanted to continue to do. So they created this Homers for Heroes. Um, it's going to, the, the mission for it is to honor the everyday heroes. You know, the people that we're talking about on the show every day, the cops, the firemen, the teachers, the nurses, the doctors, um, the delivery people, the grocery store workers that are going out of their ways to make life better for everybody. Uh, so this is, you know, what, what Pete is, this is what Pete has become. And, uh, you know, when he was with us in Brooklyn, he had just come from Florida. He was just finished the college world series. He was very much in, uh, uh, sort of self-protective mode, I guess, you know, like he wasn't overly outgoing and then didn't have uh, a ton of, uh, personality yet. And he was still figuring out his getting his, his feet wet. Um, and it's amazing to see what Pete has sort of gone on to become. Um, and, 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 you know, going from David Wright retiring and looking for sort of a new face of the franchise, obviously you have Jacob deGrom and, and, you know, the success that he's had and Michael Conforto has been great, but Pete has sort of taken the entire city by storm. Um, he's got a personality that is fit for the city. Uh, he hits big, long home runs, which, you know, everybody loves that. And, uh, you know, now he's sort of taken everything else and, and taken the leadership role in the, with the team and, doing things like this. And it really makes you, you know, appreciate what he is as a, as a person and, and uh, what he does on the baseball field, obviously, but congrats to Pete and Haley and what they're doing with uh, Homers for Heroes. And, you know, hopefully once things get back to normal for the Cyclones, we can find ways to get involved with that as well and, and give back to him. The hardest thing in, in sports is obviously to find, and you, you know this too, because you deal with so many players year after year is that really great guys who have an amazing personality, and are also unbelievable at what they do. Sometimes it's hard to find because someone's either really, really nice or really, really good and not so nice. Pete Alonso is an unbelievable marriage. Some would say once in a lifetime kind of guy. And now he's a New York Met. You have him for, that was year one. He's played one year with the Mets. Look at all this impact that he's had. Right, it's really unbelievable. And you said it perfectly. Like you, It's very rare that you find the guy who is the best player on the team that's also the best guy on the team. You know, like it's very rare to find that marriage. Um, and, you know, the Mets were lucky to have David Wright for so many years. And now it seems like he retired and Pete Alonso is starting to fill that role. So I'm excited to see what he does, not only for the team, but for the, the city here in the, the years to come. Speaking of which, 
finding the right guy tonight around one of the NFL drafts. Billy is ready. He's got his Giants jersey on. I, uh, I'm a bit of a curmudgeon with draft day. I'm a big Giants fan, but um, I left my shirt in, uh, way back in my apartment on the third floor. No, I only have like one floor. Uh, it's in my bedroom, uh, folded up in the corner because I've got to wash it. Uh, but Billy, tonight's draft night, obviously Giants and Jets will be picking uh, in the first round. Giants have the fourth pick. Jets have the 11th. It's only round one tonight and then two and three tomorrow, four through seven on Saturday. What are you looking forward to about tonight's um, selection? I guess my biggest thing that I'm looking forward to tonight is if it actually works. <laughs> uh, the fact that they're doing this across the country with all these coaches and scouts with wireless and knowing how everybody's computer is all of a sudden going to pop up for uh, you need to update your Java or something like that. Like that's what I'm looking forward to. First of all, um, and just to see if they can pull it off, which is, is bonkers. I'm looking forward to having sports, mm. any type of sports. I am just a starved sports fan looking for anything. Um, in terms of the Giants, I think, um, you know, they took Daniel Jones last year. They took Saquon the year before. Um, you know, those are like sexy picks, you know, the, the guys that the skill position guys, I think they need to go offensive line, which isn't very sexy in terms of, you know, big dude that you, but you need them, you need them to win. Um, so <laughs> I, I expect them to take an offensive lineman. Uh, it seems like Willis or Scherf are the two guys that people are sort of circling the wagons around. So, um, we'll see what happens. It's not going to be a guy whose jersey you get, but hopefully it's a guy who keeps the people whose jersey you do get safe for the next decade or so. Yeah, I, uh, these are great. I'm a big sports fan, but a lot of New York lives and dies with every pick. I, I just I envision the pick going wrong for both the Jets and the Giants and like Joe and Evan at WFAN just getting call after call after call about how this is the worst guy. We don't know. Eric Flowers is supposed to be this unbelievable offensive tackle from Miami. The guy is six foot a thousand. He's Frankenstein with a helmet on. He's going to be unbelievable. He's a bust. Daniel Jones, what are they doing? Hey, he's pretty good. You just don't know. So I have one word for everybody tonight. Just patience. Just wait. Just please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, when you look at stuff like, you know, Patrick Mahomes goes in the middle of the draft and Russell Wilson goes late in, in the middle rounds and Tom Brady goes all the way at the end. Nobody knows what they're doing. You know, these guys that are making mock drafts, are like, oh, how are they taking this guy? I'm going to give him a C when the draft's over. Nobody knows. It's absolutely outrageous. Nobody has seen these guys play in South Dakota State unless you're some degenerate gambler. Um, so you don't really have any real first-hand knowledge of who these people are. So nobody knows what they're talking about. They just Everybody wants everybody to draft a wide receiver because that's who we know. We like guys that score touchdowns, but nobody knows. Yeah, I think the last dance helped us find out that uh, it was Clyde Frazier and all those guys said, yeah, Michael Jordan, he's 6'6". He can't carry a team. So that is my favorite line in sports. Nobody knows anything. True. We, we do know how to bring smiles, Bill. This is a terrific slice of life. Glad you got your jersey on. Hopefully I'll uh, somehow find a way to wash my shirt for tomorrow so we can celebrate whomever the Giants take it for. Yeah, we'll see. It'll be definitely a topic for tomorrow. And then the best part of the NFL draft, it goes on for days. So you're going to have a round tonight. People will talk about it all day tomorrow. Then they'll have more rounds. People will talk about guys that they don't know who they are in the fourth round. Then you got three more rounds. So let's just go. And I, the internet's going to crash. Somebody's going to hack it. Like, it's going to be great. There's going to be something absolutely insane that just takes over. Beautiful, Bill. See you tomorrow. Have a good night. <laughs>